very much for the introduction to Mazel and also thank you very much for organizing this event and for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. So we will hear uh, today for me probably about topics that you have heard of already this week, but maybe a little bit a different aspect. You will also see that my talk is quite classical and not that quantum, less quantum probably than what you have heard. And the reason for this is that I look at so my background is classical information theory and look at quantum phenomena from the point of view of classical information. And this actually is also a quantum information about it's about grasping physics and grasping quantum theory yeah. with the tools of classical information. And one of the first people who started somehow to look at this connection was uh, Gonset. He was a he was a mathematician, but then professor for philosophy at ETH, and he was saying that La logique est tout d'abord une science naturelle. Logic is a natural science. And if we want to test our logic, we have to compare it to physics. One of Gonset's pupils was Ernst Schwecker, and he was motivated by this quote by Gonset. He started asking the question in a famous paper in, in written in German in 1961, whether it's possible to embed the description of any physical system, he had in mind, of course, the quantum physical system into classical logic. So is classical logic the right is classical logic the right language to talk about physical systems, like for example a wave function, a quantum physical system? And one first answer he gave together with his postdoc Simon Cochin in a, in a paper that had become very famous in the late 60s, and the answer was for qubits, yes. For single qubits, the answer is actually yes. You can completely understand single qubits by just looking at classical information. More precisely, so if you have a qubit, a qubit in a, in a state psi, then you can classically prepare this qubit for all possible measurements which can be carried out. More precisely, you can define a random variable x, just a classical random variable x, with a distribution here like this, so the, the density, the probability density is proportional just to the scalar product. And if you have this, you have a classical preparation of this uh, qubit for all possible measurement. And this preparation is also non contextual, about this I'll uh, talk at the end of this first half what non contextual means. For the moment, it just means a consistent deterministic preparation. Also, this has also been called hidden variables. We have hidden variables, namely the strategy of the qubit when some measurement is performed on it would be to, to output the vector which is closest to x, and then we get exactly the quantum statistics. So by this, uh, they wanted to say that if the world were just composed by qubits, the world would not be quantum at all. Completely classical. They then went further, but this comes later in the talk. I will now switch to a more famous insight that also shows, and was also from the 1960s, that you have heard about already, that also showed that the world, the quantum world, is non-classical, and that was, of course, Bell. So I think you heard about it a little bit. I'll just repeat it very quickly. So Bell looked not at the single qubits, but now at pairs of qubits, and at every qubit, uh, one out of two possible measurements can be carried out. I, I show this here with playing cards, so each party, Alice and Bob, can decide to either look at the front or at the back of a playing card, but not both. And also there are only two possible outcomes you can observe, namely red or blue. And now Bell was describing, or Bell was looking at the following behavior. If both parties, with their respective playing cards, decide to look at the front of the card, they see the same color. If one party looks at the front of the card and the other party looks at the back of his card, they also see the same color. Vice versa, so if Bob decides to look at the, the, the back side of the card and Alice, uh, sorry, and Bob, Alice at the back side, Bob at the front side, and they also see the same color, that's still very consistent, so this behavior is possible with playing cards. But now, if both parties decide to look at the back of their cards, they will see always different colors. And now, we, we have behavior, of course, as you see here, if you put all together, which is not possible anymore to observe with, with playing cards that have fixed colorings. And what you can achieve with fixed colorings, this is characterized by what is called the Bayesian inequality, 
and if you have a behavior which cannot be described with fixed colorings of playing cards, or which you cannot describe within classical logic, this is called non-locality, this violation of value inequality. So the behavior here was idealized, but this behavior was by Popescu and Wolfowicz, you have heard also of this object before, the non-local box or PR box, as follows. So both parties have an, have an input bit, which determines which side of the card they want to look at, and they get an output bit, and the behavior that we have here is uh, compressing this formula, the XOR of the, of the outputs is equal to the end of the input. So this is now such a behavior which is, well, classically, as we have seen, not possible perfectly, but we have four conditions that are contradictory, so you can have this behavior classically only with probability 75%, three quarters, but if you have seen singlet states, because they behave like this, if you measure uh, the two quantum systems in a singlet, then the probability that you get the same result, if I exchange here 0 and 1, that you get the same result is the co-square of the angle between them, and if you measure, so if if you're looking at the card, it's interpreted as a measurement of a photon, where this measurement is the front of the card and this measurement is the back side of the card, and corresponding here, then we get this behavior that I've described here now is co square of 22.5 degrees, which is about 85%. So we have a behavior which is beyond what we can explain with classical logic. EPR, 1935, Einstein and his co authors, they said that. Quantum theory should be understood with classical logic, and Ben argued here it's not possible. So we have these correlations which seem to appear spontaneously. This has been called non locality, and it, it looks like as if the, the photons are talking to each other. I will come to that later, whether it's, it's reasonable to assume that they actually do talk to each other. But now, when we have this phenomenon, of course, as engineers, we would ask first what can we do with it? Is it useful for some, some applications? Then we would, maybe as scientists, we would ask ourselves whether we can find properties of this phenomenon. We can study it in more detail. We'll talk about this a little bit. Whether again we can, we can understand it maybe in terms of classical logic, our way of thinking. And in the end, we probably also ask whether there are some more philosophical implications of the phenomenon. This I will talk about at the end here and then also in the second hour. So, first to the usefulness. What are applications of this? You have heard already by Tony Asin about device independent QPD. I just repeat this uh, quite quickly on a high level. So it was first out to ECHO to observe that non locality could be maybe useful for information processing. And the reasoning of ECHO was the following. We have a, a, an entangled, excuse me, an entangled pair that leads to a maximum bail violation. Then quantum theory tells us that this state must be close to a single. And actually that violation that we have seen before is the highest that you can have and the singlet is essentially the same state that the only state that reaches is high violation. And the singlet state has in particular the property that it's a pure state, that is if you carry out measurement on the quantum state according to quantum theory, what some adversary would measure outside this pure state would be completely decorrelated. So the reasoning again within quantum theory is that the outcomes are random, in this case here, from the point of view of e friend, so secret. Now, this is not really a direct application of the violation of value inequality to obtain secrecy because we always need these whole formulas of quantum theory. But what other people then have observed, for example, Eckhart Tolle and Kent, was that th the reason why we believe that outcomes of quantum measurements are actually really random, so why it cannot be explained by hidden variables, but the reason for this, again, is non-locality. So they thought that, so if, if here, this step, here, non-locality is essential, and again, in this second step, also non-locality is essential, then people are asking, can the argument not be made more direct? And this was what Barrett argued and Kent did. So they, they pulled quantum theory just completely out of the picture, and they did a reasoning completely based on non signaling only. And this is, a, is, a, is the somehow most extreme form of device independent QKD because you don't even depend on the correctness as quantum theory as an accurate description of nature. 
So that was the idea. Now let's look at the reasoning. So let's look at first the idealized system, namely a PR box. So if we have a PR box, a perfect PR box, is it possible, again now under this non signaling condition, so no instantaneous message transition is possible, is it possible that the outputs to the PR box are biased? Are not completely unbiased. Let's assume that. So let's assume that the output here on, on Alice's side, given the input is 0, 0, is slightly biased towards 0, say. So that, that's what I mean here. The output is biased towards 0. But now, because of the PR condition, the two outputs have to be equal. Again, the PR condition is that the XR of the outputs equals the end of the inputs. Here, the end of the inputs is 0, so the outputs have to be equal. If this output is biased towards zero and there are equal, so also that output here must be biased, biased towards zero. If I change Bob's input key to one because of non signaling, on Alice's side the distribution should not change. This is what is called non signaling. Alice cannot statistically detect what Bob is doing. If nature, maybe nature is different, but then we have to really redo our theory. So let's assume this non signaling. Now again, because the end of the input bit is zero, Bob's bit has to be equal to Alice's bit, so also this bit is biased towards zero. Uh, by symmetry, I can make the same argument for the input combination to one zero. And now again, because of non signaling, well, if Bob now changes his input to one, again, his bias towards zero should, should be there. By symmetric argument, we would have also the bias towards zero on Alice's side, but now we have a contradiction, because two bits which are both biased towards zero cannot be different with probability one. And according to the PR condition, if the input combination is one, one, they would have to be different with probability one. So our initial assumption was wrong, the bits cannot be biased. And this perfect unbiasedness means perfect secrecy because you can carry out this whole argument from the point of view of the adversary. So this is how perfect secrecy can be achieved from perfect PR boxes, but unfortunately, as we have seen and as Stilson has shown, perfect PR boxes do not occur in nature. We only have approximations and it is 85%. So the, the idea was to maybe get key agreement if I take a lot of systems that are in a single state, where I get this violation of available inequality up to some amount, but not perfect PR boxes, and then carry out make sure the space-like separation by just measuring at the same time and then measuring all of these particles and apply some function f that would lead me maybe to a shorter key here to drop a secret key probably we have been talking about it this is called privacy amplification so one could imagine that this might be possible now unfortunately there does not actually exist any function f that would lead to a good secret key here in the most general case where if is only limited by the non signaling condition. Then another idea one might have is that maybe one can generate from weak non-locality strong non-locality. We'll talk about this in a minute. But the results that we know here are pessimistic. It seems that it's not possible to amplify non-locality. So if, if you have a weak violation of a bad inequality, it seems to be not possible to generate stronger violations. This would be very useful because stronger violations are just more useful in the information processing. Okay, so now no, no privacy amplification exists in this setting, so you might think whether maybe it helps to strengthen the setting. This gray bar here is a space-like separation. Now the idea was that maybe it helps if you introduce additional space-like separations here within the labs of Alice and Bob. So we have here on Alice's side these end systems. We can also force these end systems in Alice's lab not to communicate. And that was actually the idea that worked. So if these labs here are also separate, we call this the long office protocol because you can work in the long office and again make sure the space-like separation by just the distance between the measurement events and and the uh, and, 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 and measuring simultaneously. And then actually, suddenly, very simple privacy amplification becomes possible. Let me just roughly just apply the XOR. So if you take enough quantum systems, measure, and then you take the XOR, then you have a secret key uh, that is unknown to Eve. And then, so this gives you 
uh, even a noise tolerant protocol because you don't have to get to maximum violation of value inequality like you have to, for example, in Barry Clark and Kent protocol. It's, not it's also more efficient, so the security parameter goes down exponentially with the number of systems and not only linearly, like it was in Barry Clark and Kent system. This is device independent, as you have seen in Tony's talk, independent of quantum physics. So the proof only depends on non signaling. So you only need the non signaling assumption. Plus, on the I'll talk about this later. And so this seems to be a bit difficult to realize these complete uh, non signaling conditions on both sides here in both laboratories. But it has been shown that this is actually necessary. If you have only one way non signaling, this is, this is in general not possible. Uh, and these conditions are generated the secret key. So this was the part on quantum cryptography. Now I already mentioned that it's maybe interesting to study just non-locality as a phenomenon. For example, to ask yourself whether it's possible again to, to obtain a strong non-locality like PR box, the strongest possible non-locality in the binary input, binary output setting, two part setting. Is it possible maybe to obtain the PR box, this perfect ideal system, from weaker non-locality? This is certainly interesting because if we have the PR box, as we have seen before in this argument, we immediately get perfect secrecy, probably we also get perfect randomness. We'll talk about randomness later. If you have 91% approximations of PR boxes, you get a complete complex collapse of communication complexity. Every communication complexity problem becomes trivial. And here, well, here we have some different applications. So as soon as you get over what is quantum physically achievable, so this is this here is what you can achieve classically. It's just shared information, classical information, classical logic. If you have quantum states, you get to here. So these are these eighty-five percent. Approximation of the PR box this year would be 75%. It has been shown by several authors that as soon as you, you beat the quantum bound, you get quite interesting information theoretical applications. One example is violation of information causality. It's interesting, it happens exactly here and could be used as a, as a defining principle for quantum theory in terms, again, of classical information. If you want to describe or understand quantum theory in terms of classical information. But anyway, it's clear that it's interesting to go up, to find protocols that allow you to go up here in this scale. And this has been looked at by several people, and Boom and Fitchik have shown that in principle such amplification of non-locality can indeed be possible, and this is both true outside the, the quantum region where actually you can go almost up to the PR box, but also within. What is clear, what is already, what has already been shown by Zilofen, is that you cannot overstep here this, this bound, so you can never get from a quantum physically realized to a system to a, to a system that is beyond this. There are also pessimistic results. So, for example, distillation seems to be impossible, at most very limited, within the quantum bound. This has actually been shown recently also by Bybee that here no, distillation is completely impossible. And also, so another question was for a long time what happens here beyond the quantum region is maybe distillation possible there, but also there at least not much can be done or on certain assumptions nothing can be done at all. I think Bybee's proof here is unconditional. So like this proof shows here, the complete impossibility of amplification of non locality here is on some conditions, I think, uh, for deterministic protocols. Well, so, this is quite pessimistic, so it seems you cannot really amplify non locality. Good. As a, as a next topic in this first hour, I would like again to go back to Spectro. So, again, he asks, how far and how far can we describe quantum theory with classical logic? What does, what does it mean in this context here? So let's look at the quantum channel. So this is a channel connecting Alice and Bob 
where Alice can choose a quantum state, for example a qubit state, and send it over to Bob. Bob should just be able to carry out a measurement on this, because this has been called also classical teleportation, and then get the measurement, the result. So, in the end, this is a classical problem, because the quantum state is a classical thing, it can be described by two real numbers, and the case is also, there is a classical description of the basis, and the measurement result is a classical bit. So, of course, one way to solve this a priori classical problem is to use a qubit channel where you can send over this quantum bit and Bob can actually carry out the measurement. But you can ask yourself also whether you can replace this quantum channel by a classical thing, like a classical channel. And it has been shown by several people that surprisingly a finite amount of classical communication is enough. That's surprising because well, as I said, a quantum state is characterized by two real numbers, which would be an infinite amount of classical information, but it's actually enough to just send over two bits over this classical channel to enable this, this classical teleportation. They also have actually later have shown that one bit plus one PR box is enough, which is interesting because a PR box is a non signaling resource. But if you combine it with communication, you can strengthen actually communication and get like communication value. These two bits that we see are actually not optimal, at least not in a symptotic setting as my collaborator Lugano Alberto has shown. And he could reduce this amount of communication that you need per transmission of qubit to 1.28 bits. And what his idea was to use a very old result to show that, namely what I mentioned before, this coaching Becker model. So again, coaching Becker tries to somehow make classical a qubit by a classical random variable x, which is distributed like this around the quantum state psi here. And the idea of coaching Becker was to prepare a qubit for all possible measurements. Deterministic way. What it means here is that this following thing, this triplet of, of values, is a Markov chain. Why? Well, because you can determine the outcome of the quantum measurement by just this classical variable here, x. And this allows you now the fact that this is a Markov chain, which means the measurement outcome only depends on this variable x. This allows you to apply the reverse Shannon theorem. So Shannon's Channel coding theorem tells you that if you have a noisy channel, how many bits you can carry over classically over the channel. Now the converse of Shannon's theorem makes the opposite. So if you want to simulate a certain noisy channel, how many uh, perfect bits of communication do you need? That's the reverse Shannon theorem. And the answer is well, it's just the information between x and psi viewed as classical random variables. The communication rate, if you want to simulate this uh, carrying over of this classical teleportation, the, the communication rate is just limited by this information here, the signing information between these classical variables, which he computed to be 1.28 bits. So that's this coherent spectral model. Just a quick remark on this. So, what has also been shown by Leo Bush, like a former PhD student of mine, was that. You can also use this famous cryptographic primitive of oblivious transfer. I don't know if you have heard about this in this week, most of you probably know about it. So in oblivious transfer, you have one party, Alice, who can send over two bits, again two classical bits, and the other party can choose which bit to read and will not get any information about the other bit. But this is a secrecy primitive. But we view it here purely as a communication primitive. It's also an interesting communication primitive. And as it turns out, it seems to be exactly the communication primitive that corresponds to sending a qubit. So classical teleportation exactly becomes possible if you have this obvious transfer, which of course somehow is between sending one bit and two bits. It's more than sending one bit, because Alice can put the same bit here into both entries of the OT, then you have sent one bit. But in a sense, it's also more than sending one bit because she can send, she can do two different bits, and but Bob can choose one of them. 
with less than sending two bits as a communication primitive somewhere, somewhere in between. And the question would then be, is it fair to say that the communication value of a bit is transfer is something like 1.28 bits? And this is true in this context of classical teleportation of a quantum state. Probably it's not true in any more general sense than this. Let's go back quickly to this analysis that Montina did of, of uh, classical teleportation or in general of the communication complexity of quantum channels. So again, he wants to measure a quantum power, so the, the power of sending quantum states over a quantum channel. He wants to measure this completely within classical information. How much classical information does this correspond to? So in the general setting, you in the general setting, we have here a quantum state from a set S that is sent over the quantum channel. Bob can choose a measurement to be carried out on this state from some set of measurements M and gets a result. And now, Montina again was asking in general what is the classical communication value of this? And of course, here what is important is that only one of these measurements can be carried out. So, of course, you have to send somehow all results of all possible measurements, but Bob can only carry out one measurement. So what you're allowed to do is to put correlations in this data, maybe correlations that would occur if you did different measurements on the state which you cannot do. And then you can minimize, again by applying the reversion and here, you can minimize over all these communications that you can these correlations that you can put in the data, and this minimization would give you, again, the, the communication value, the classical communication value when you send the quantum state. Now, to make such an analysis for a quantum channel is quite a natural thing, because a quantum channel is a communication thing, quantum, quantum information is sent, but of course you can also do this analysis with non-signaling quantum systems, with non-locality, with just entangled systems. And there, well, it's a bit stranger, because now what you want to simulate with communication is not itself communication, does not itself allow for communication. But still you can ask the question. So again, you can ask the question, if I want to have the behavior of a singlet state, how much communication would have to go on behind the scenes to get the same behavior? So again, I have this, so I share here the singlet state, I have the parties who both do a measurement, they can choose from a big set of measurements, maybe any measurement, here in this case, any von Neumann measurement, it's not restricted, and they get a measurement outcome. And now, in order to get this behavior, you can try to find out how much communication would have to be transmitted over the classical channel. Donald Bacon's result is that one bit is enough, and actually this bit is not a perfectly random bit, so even in the air result, it's actually less if you look at it in the asymptotic scenario because the data can be compressed, the data that has to be sent over here. But now again, if you use the coach spectrum model, you can again reduce this amount of communication quite dramatically to this 0 0.28 bits here. So it's, it's always one bit less than the quantum channel. So the entanglement simulation is always one bit less than the perfect uh, quantum channel. You can also try to apply this to non-maximally entangled states. So still pure states, but non-maximally entangled. Why are we interested in these? Well, there are some results by Chisa and Brunner indicating that non-locality and entanglement are not the same resource. In particular, it is possible that the state can be more weakly entangled, but stronger non-local. In some setting, they look at simulation through PR boxes. So we can now ask the question using these methods here, these analysis methods, whether this is true. In, in general, also in the asymptotic setting, that is, whether the communication complexity, the price to simulate the entanglement can also be higher for non-maximum entangled states than for maximum entangled states. And it seems that this, this is the case. So it seems that non-locality or the communication cost does not always grow monotonically with the entanglement. So probably it's not the case, but this still work in progress. But it seems that this phenomenon Chisa and Bono discovered of normality and entanglement being different resources 
is true also in the asymptotic settings. It's not only a marginal effect that we have foreseen in the copies. Good. Now, so, as I said, so we have here somehow a classical understanding of non-locality, of a non-signaling phenomenon, but the classical understanding of the signaling. There are some theories, like Bohm's, Bohmian mechanics, where this is really actually to be considered real. So, some people will believe that nature uses influences, uses signaling to really establish these correlations. The question is here now, a different one, not only to quantify this communication, but that it's, it's realistic or natural to assume that this is how nature really works. I'll talk about this, I'll talk about this after the break. I will continue. Now, I will go back to the initial result I talked about this question by Specker and the answer by Cotin and Specker. First about qubits, as we have discussed about qubits, Cotin and Specker said qubits are classical. Qubits can be complete, individual qubits can be described classically totally. In this 1961 paper, where this question is asked here, however, Specker gives a different answer as long as you go beyond qubits. And this was three years before John Bell. More precisely, he said that, that there's a simple geometric argument that shows that in general no consistent prophecies are possible. So he was talking about prophecies about the system. That is, can you predict the quantum system for all possible measurements, of which you can carry out only one? A possible concerning the behavior of the quantum system he, he did not give this argument. This is quite funny. It's a bit like Feynman. So he said, yeah, I don't have space. I have a very simple argument that I cannot give it. But I'm not sure he had it because it took six years and a postdoc, Simon Cochin, to finally come up with this argument. And the argument was not really that simple. So this was the original form of the argument. So in this graph here, it has become quite famous. Uh, a point is a vector and two Vectors are connected when they are orthogonal. So here it is about the classical preparation for all possible measurements of a Q-trit. So today we know simple arguments, and so what did they actually show? Funnily, there is this uh, picture here by Escher, where this object is of interest. It's funnily from the same year, also 1961, probably a coincidence. But this here is what we know today is the simplest coach Becker set, the simplest set of vectors that shows that the Q-trick behavior is beyond classical logic. So more precisely, we take here all vectors from the center to all points at the outside here of these three cubes. I don't show you the whole set here, but just a part of it. So if you take the whole set, then we have the following property. So these sets are should to uh, correspond to measurements on a qubit, so more precisely, if you have uh, uh, three orthogonal vectors, this is a measurement on a qubit. And the idea was that a classical preparation for all these measurements that you can carry out on a qubit would be a coloring. The meaning here would be that one vector is green, this would be the measurement outcome of this measurement, and the other two vectors would be red. They asked for this to be non contextual. Non-contextuality means that the color of a vector does not depend on the context. So however you, you extend a certain vector to a full basis, it should always have the same color. Which means that if you carry out the measurement here, this space is here, and this vector is the output, then this vector should also be the output if you carry out the measurement with respect to a different basis containing this vector. One can discuss how natural this condition is, probably non-locality, or locality is a more natural condition than this non-context world here. Let's see, they, they thought it was a quite natural condition, it has also been linked to, to some barely non-locality. In any case, what they show is that then, if you want to have this condition, even in dimension 3, no coloring is possible. So you cannot color these vectors, you will always run into a contradiction. So, no way. Green color exists such that on every basis there is exactly one green. Now, and this is, as I've said already, this is actually quite closely linked to Bell type non locality. So let's look at 
And such a coach is back for set now, and it is set here. And let's look at the following game, which is played between two parties, Alice and Bob. The chair, again, casts the information, so lambda is, as usual, a, a hidden variable, a classic variable, a real number. And now the game is the following. Alice gets as input one of the bases that you can form, one of the orthonormal bases that you can form out of the vectors of the set, also Bob. And they both have to output one of the vectors of this set, one of the three. And the winning condition of this game is that they win if and only if the output vectors are not orthogonal. If they are orthogonal, they lose. Which means, of course, in particular, if they get the same basis as input, they also have to output the same vector. And now one can simply argue that this game cannot be won classically. So again, if you have only classical information shared between Alice and Bob, it's impossible to win this game, it's probability 1. This is so-called pseudo-telepathy game, these games have been called like that. That you cannot win with certainty, classically. Why? Well, because a classical winning strategy would exactly be such a covering coach and backer show to not exist. Because for every basis, our classical strategy should determine which vector is the corresponding output. And for the same basis on both sides, it should be the same vector. So it will be a fixed coloring, and we know that such a coloring is not exist. If, on the other hand, Alice and Bob share a quantum state, namely the maximum entangled Q trade pair, then they can very easily win this game because that's actually exactly the property that you have. So if you measure this state here in two or orthonormal bases, then what you know is that your outputs will never be orthogonal. This is exactly what correct. So quantum mechanically, it's quite easy to win this game. So this is a, quite a direct connection between bell type non-locality and coaching vector type impossibility of quantum of classical logical explanation of quantum theory. Now there's one aspect that is always very important in hidden variable no-go results, and that has been discussed also by Specker in his 1961 paper. He says that the statements that you get to, if you look at the coach vector theorem, but it also applies to Bell, which came later, is that when we compare it to the scholastic speculation about insultuabili, there is the question whether divine omniscience also covers what would have happened if something had happened that did not actually happen. So this is what you always have to use in your argumentation. You always have to invoke, even if you look at Bell, you have to invoke measurements or results of measurements that you actually don't carry out. So when I showed you the, the Bell, the original Bell argument with these playing cards, you can look only at one side of the card. Suppose Alice and Bob can only choose one side of the card to look at. But still, in your argument that it's impossible to describe this classically, you always have to assume that the other side of the card could also be looked at and you have to talk about that color. So the argument always covers all the outcomes of the measurements. And Specht found that probably quite unsatisfactory. Whether this is necessary or not, again, I have to uh, take it away until after the break, where I discuss this a little bit. So the question there would be, is it possible to talk about non-locality without these counterfactuals, but in Kulturabli as I'm not in philosophy is called the counterfactual to talk about what would have happened and what would have happened. And this is closely related to the question of randomness. So what is often mentioned in the context of non-locality is randomness, that non-locality gives you a calculus for randomness, for example, randomness amplification. Device independent QKD and randomness amplification is quite closely related. But of course, you always have to start from some randomness. So you can only conclude, for example, in the argument with the PR box, you can conclude that the outputs of the box, we have seen that the outputs are unbiased, which means perfectly random. But we have to make an assumption also on randomness, namely that the inputs were, well, at least we had to assume that all four possible input combinations were, could actually occur. So we assume randomness for Alice and Bob, and then we can conclude some randomness on the outputs. So let's just very quickly look at this, the role of randomness here. I would say that the role of randomness is at the core of 
The interpretations of quantum theory, which are very popular today in quantum foundations community. And so, what randomness is, again, we'll talk more about after the break how you exactly define randomness. But for the moment, let me just say that what a result like Bell or Coach Becker implies, if you look at it only from the point of view of randomness, is the following. So, if the one who measures the particle is able to do a real coin flip and a real random bit to determine whether he wants to look at the front or the back side of the card, then also the particle's answer must be really random. So it's a relative statement. And the relative statement gives you a randomness calculus, randomness expansion, randomness amplification protocols. So what you know is that either randomness is almost everywhere or randomness is actually nowhere. There's nothing in between. So what you get a priori is kind of like a clear separation. And to the first variant here corresponds the standard interpretation of quantum theory. Going back to this people at the ball, the Born rule tells you that this is a truly random bit that you get from measuring the quantum system. So you have either the red card or the blue, and it's not determined. Physicists don't like that particularly because they don't like events with no reason for which physics has no explanation. So pop, more popular today are the deterministic interpretations and there are quite a lot of them. So there is the Bohmian interpretation which says it has only been red always, but which also then says there has only been your possibility to, to look at the front side of the card and not have been able to look at the back side. So everything is predetermined. You have no choice here. This, this interpretation is quite popular in, in Italy. There is also the interpretation that says that there are not really classical outcomes of results. If you measure a quantum system, you simply get entangled with it. In this sense, there are no colors or no classical colors there, but there's always just the superposition of them. And linked to this here is the, are the multiverse interpretations, where there's not a single reality, but always also the, the coexistence of different realities. This is somehow what comes out if you look at these quantum phenomena with a focus on randomness. But as I said, we will hear more on this randomness aspect after the break. So I propose that we have the break now. Thank you for your attention.